So today we're going to talk about surrealism, which let me tell you is a pretty, pretty complex movement to wrap our heads around. It is one that very much like Dada um, emerges first as a literary movement and then sort of expands into the realm of the visual arts. And in fact, some of the same people were at the core of each movement, most notably Andre Breton who by 1922 um, was sort of to distance himself from Dada um, with the idea that Dada had become too institutionalized. So Dada begins to wane and we get the emergence of surrealism by 1924. It is in 1924 that Breton writes um, the Surrealist Manifesto, his first one in 1924. There was another that followed in 1930. In the Manifesto of 1924, Breton gives a definition of surrealism and he describes it as pure psychic automatism by which it is intended to express either verbally or in writing the true function of thought thought dictated in the absence of all control exerted by reason and outside all aesthetic or moral preoccupation. Surrealism is based on the belief in the superior reality of certain forms of association heretofore neglected in the omnipotence of the dream and in the disinterested play of thought. It leads to the permanent destruction of all other psychic mechanisms and to its substitution for them in the solution of the principal problems of life. Breton um, becomes sort of the unofficial leader, sort of the acknowledged leader of the movement of surrealism. He was sort of self-appointed in that way. Um, in 1925, they held their first um, group exhibition which includes actually some of the works of people we've seen in the past, um, like Clay and Man Ray and De Chirico and Picasso, who we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, and like some of the other movements we've seen, they form their own journal or a magazine, which was Minotaur, which ran throughout most of the 1930s, from about 1933 to 1939. Now, while we're talking about time periods, it's important to note that this was a period of a lot of crisis in Europe. And we've talked about this with some of the German expressionists, the idea that post-World War I was a very traumatic period. There was a lot of financial crises. Um, and certainly in the 1930s, we're going to see increasingly the rise of fascism. Like the Dadaists, many of the Surrealists were anarchists politically. And again, it's the same thing we talked about with Dada. It's sort of the idea that um, it was these traditional forms of government and reason that led the whole world to this tremendous catastrophe of war. And so the idea then was to reject those things, to reject any form of government um, with the idea that the irrational was preferable to the rational. So um, let's talk a little bit about the path that surrealism takes us down because it is not going to head down the same path as some of the purely um, sort of abstract artists that we've seen. Um, in other words, artists who are pursuing just these sort of aesthetic paths. Instead, the idea for the surrealist was that artistic genius comes from um, the ability to tap into the unconscious. And you can see um, in Breton's definition, they talk about this, the omnipotence of the dream, the disinterested play of thought, um, the absence of control. The idea was that by tapping into these, um, this un unconscious level is how you created the true artist. Now, by the 1920s, 
Um, the teachings of Sigmund Freud were very popular both in Europe and in North America. And it is Freud's ideas that become very, very important for the surrealists. And there are two major ideas that come from Freud that are going to lead our discussion today. One is the interest in the dream. And the dreams are sort of the manifestation of the unconscious. So that's the first. The second is this idea um, which Freud talks about as fetishism, which is the idea that um, certain objects um, will become particularly important, um, uh, either sort of physical or optical interest because of traumatic experiences of your past. And both of those things are going to play a major role in some of the art objects that we look at today. Now, um, Breton, by 1922, was starting to play with the idea of automatic writing. Now, we've talked about this in the past when we talked about Paul Clay and his Twittering machine. Remember the idea of taking a line for a walk, the idea of sort of letting your unconscious guide your marks and then looking for images in them. Well, Breton starts to experiment with first automatic writing. Um, there was a game that was called Exquisite Corpse. It was sort of a surrealist game where people would take turns writing words on a piece of paper and you would get um, a sentence but you could only see part of it and you had to continue the sentence and when the whole thing was unveiled you got these sort of nonsensical things but it was a way of writing sort of by accident um, it was called exquisite corpse because of the sentence the exquisite corpse will drink the young wine so the idea of this became <clears throat> began as a literary idea but then it becomes important for the surrealists as this idea of composing images without any sort of preconception on the part of the artist. In other words, the artist becomes passive. He records things rather than creating things. That's going to be important, again, both for the idea of the interest in dreams and the unconscious, and we're going to see artists increasingly um, use accidental techniques in their art as well. And again, you're going to see the relationship of this with Dada because we saw something similar when we looked at um, Arp and his collage created according to the laws of chance. But in terms of the interest in um, sort of this dream state and the interest in the unconscious, there was this idea that um, there was sort of a not real, an artificial boundary between the outside world, the sort of quote unquote real world and man's inner world. And that the surrealists were making that inner world as important as the outer visible one. So there are generally speaking two major categories of surrealism and we divide them up into these groups. These groups are called various things. There's no one good term for them. <laughs> so the first group of the surrealists, or the first kind of surrealism, we sometimes refer to as biomorphic or abstraction. Now these are, or sometimes we call it absolute surrealism. And these are gonna be the artists who are very interested in automatism. Again, that idea of accident, of chance, of removing um, the, the sort of purposeful intention of the artist. So become very interested in um, depicting forms that were seemingly abstract, although you're going to see in a lot of cases they are still recognizable. And so I'm showing you an example of a work by Miro as a perfect example of this sort of abstract or absolute or biomorphic surrealism. On the other side, we have <clears throat> a style that we sometimes call veristic surrealism. And this is a kind of surrealism that is painted with a tremendous faithfulness to the world around you. Objects are painted with meticulous detail, very precisely, um, but the images are very interested in the unconscious. So world um, images are painted um, as if they're realistic, but 
the objects are usually somewhat irrational. So for example, you'll have um, objects that are in weird associations with each other or objects that change their characteristics some like things like inanimate objects becoming alive um, so that these objects make you question um, the boundaries between truth and reality and sort of bring out the absurdity in the world so as you could see here I'm showing you a picture by Magritte and we'll talk about this more but it is a very faithful detailed representation of a recognizable object. So those are the two different camps that we're going to be looking at. Now surrealism itself eventually um, begins to fracture. As you can see, by the way, even just looking at these two works I'm showing you, surrealism is not one definitive style. It was seen as a sort of a lifestyle rather than an, a style in the artistic sense of the word and eventually schisms start to appear um, people you know were fighting about people who weren't following the tenets of surrealism closely enough it became there became infighting within the groups so what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the artists who very much fit into the surrealist camp and we're also going to pull in some artists who were on the periphery of the surrealists, not really following the manifestos or participating in exhibitions, but who were sort of adopted by the surrealists because of their aesthetics. The first artist we're going to talk about is the German painter and sculptor, collage maker, Max Ernst. Um, Ernst spends um, four years in the German army. Then he's in Cologne, where he's very much associated with Dada. And then finally, he moves to Paris in 1922. He comes into the circle of the Surrealists and Breton. Um, and then he becomes um, very much an active participant in the Surrealist movement by 1925. He is going to be one of the most interesting artists to talk about in terms of technique and thinking about new processes with which to make art incorporating surrealist ideas of chance. Um, as a note, he is an interesting character, if you can't tell by his photo montage self-portrait here. He um, made notes for his own autobiography. And so here would be his description of his birth. He said, Max Ernst had his first contact with the world of sense on the 2nd of April, 1891 at 9.45 a.m when he emerged from the egg which his mother had laid in an eagle's nest and which the bird had incubated for seven years. Um, he also described his service in World War I like this. Max Ernst died on the 1st of August, 1914. He returned to life on the 11th of November, 1918, a young man who wanted to become a magician and find the central myth of his age. From time to time, he consulted the eagle, which had guarded the egg of his prenatal existence. This, the bird's advice can be detected in his work. So let's see if we can find the bird's advice in his work. We're going to look um, at two works by Ernst. Um, one which will give him a sense of him sort of at the foundation of surrealism, and another which is going to show us more about his innovations in terms of technique. Now the first work we're going to look at by Ernst is Two Children Are Threatened by a Nightingale. Now this is an unusual kind of object because it is, we could either call it a construction or we could call it a painting assemblage, right? Because this is made of both a painting within a frame, but we also have some real objects affixed to the surface. Most notably, there is a three-dimensional gate and I'm going to pull up my laser pointer. You can see the three-dimensional gate here. There's this little wooden knob. There is a building, and on that building there is a lever. And all of these objects, particularly the gate and the button, sort of break over the frame a little bit and project into our space. And so they call attention to the ambiguity between what is the space of the picture and what is the space of our world. Um, now, you, it's very interesting because it feels like we're looking through a window. And if you remember one of the earliest works we've looked at this entire semester, 
the very beginning of the class, we were talking about the idea that in the Renaissance, they thought of a painting like looking through a window into a sort of a real three-dimensional reality. Well, when we look through this window, there are some parts of this picture that are quite traditional. We have a view, a perspectival view into the distance. We have what we call linear perspective, where we could see this wall sort of moving into the deep distance. So we sense that this is a deep space. And we have what we call atmospheric perspective, where forms um, become blurred and lose their color in the distance, like this building. The buildings in the background are quite classical. Well, there's a domed sort of a temple maybe with towers, and here there's a triumphal arch, um, which was common in antiquity, also in 19th century though, and sort of a classical revival with a sculpture on the top. And actually the figures in the foreground, these two children, one standing, one lying down, are wearing sort of vaguely classical gowns. And because the figures are devoid of color, they sort of look a little bit like statues. So on the one hand, there is this deep three-dimensional perspectival space, and then um, it's also projecting into our world. And so we see this sort of tension between these two different things. Now, um, while we're talking about the way the picture melds with our world, you'll notice that the painted frame or the frame um, is again, part of our part of our world, right? Normally the frame is like the boundary, but that boundary is broken. And you can also see at the bottom, it's broken again when an inscription appears on the inner edge of the frame. And that is actually the title of the work, written in French, um, almost like it's a sort of museum label, except it is handwritten on it. Um, this is a very, very unusual thing. It's actually a line taken from a poem that Ernst had written before he began this work. And that was unusual for him, for him to determine um, really the subject, the literal subject of the picture before he began to paint. And Ernst wrote about this in the third person. He talked about himself. He said, he never imposes a title on a painting. He waits until a title imposes itself. Here, however, the title existed before the picture was painted. A few days before, he had written a prose poem which began, as night falls at the edge of town, two children are threatened by a nightingale. He did not attempt to illustrate this poem, but that is the way it happened. Um, the nightingale was an important sort of um, figure for him, because um, twice before, um, Ernst had written about the nightingale as being a menacing creature um, related to two events from 1897. Um, one was the death of his sister, and another one was when he had this sort of vision, when he had a very bad fever. And in the wood grain, on like the furniture or the floor of his room, like in the wood, um, he could see, and he says, successively, the aspect of an eye, a nose, a bird's head, a menacing nightingale. So that is what we see here. So two children are threatened by a nightingale. Now, literally, we can see these things in the center of the picture. We see um, the body of one mature child on the ground and then another who's running and holding a knife in the air and looking up towards this very small non-threatening looking bird in the sky and then we see other figures who are not mentioned in the title there is a male figure who is very precariously balanced on the top of this house-like structure um, who's holding a younger child, a younger girl, and we see him look as if he's about to flee the scene as he reaches for this knob at the edge of the frame, once again making it ambiguous um, about this world and our world. So that is that surrealist quality. These are elements that emerge from sort of this dreamlike vision that he has. Um, you could see it's the way it's tied up with words. And again, surrealism was a literary movement. And you could see the way that it's showing very literal recognizable objects. This is that um, second sort of surrealism. These are literal objects, but they're juxtaposed and created in this way that gives the picture the sense of the absurd.
Now, I mentioned that Ernst used some really interesting techniques. And so I'm just showing you two of them here. And actually, you know frottage, even if you've never used the word for it. Um, it comes from the French word for to rub. So it's a rubbing. So basically what frottage was, was to put paper over a textured surface um, and like wood and then to rub a soft pencil or a crayon um, so that that texture comes through the paper. So that's something that we've all done. The idea with um, the Surrealists is that um, he would find, again, this comes from that idea that he saw forms as, you know, when he was a younger man in like the wood nodding in his room when he was having this fever dream. So the idea is you could create or find textures on anything and then you would see forms in them. So it again had that element of the accidental. Um, so chance would create images in them. Um, the other technique um, is called grattage, which means scraping. And in this, it's actually a similar technique because you're using texture underneath the surface, but here you're looking at a painting. In grattage, you would put a textured surface underneath the surface you're going to be painting on. Um, you put paint on the surface and then you'd scrape the paint off and it would retain that pattern of the texture as you scrape the paint off and remove it, you'd see that texture underneath. And so again, it works, it's a different technique because um, you're removing to find surface and here you're working with paint. But again, it's this interest in fortuitous images, accidental images, taking textures that exist in one context and looking at them in another context. So you know, finding texture in a piece of fabric and then turning it into trees in a forest, for example. So frottage and grattage are two techniques he's using quite a bit. And there's yet another of one of these accidental techniques that he makes use of here in this really fantastic painting, um, which is called decalomania. Um, now, this is a technique that was not his invention. It was actually invented by a Spanish surrealist named Oscar Dominguez. In Decalomania, um, you have a wet painted surface. So you might paint on a piece of panel or on canvas. And then you either put paper or glass on top of the wet paint. Um, and then you pull it off, pull off the paper or the glass and you get these chance air bubbles and the paint moves in different ways and it becomes a very textured surface as the paint gets pulled up by the glass or paper as it's being removed. Um, and then the artist will you know, take a brush and then manipulate the forms a little bit and it ends up making um, these forms look a little bit like coral as an example. Um, and they look very three-dimensional because of the way that the, um, the paint lifts off the surface. So you get these sort of ridges and strange shapes and surfaces. So that is the technique that he's using here to create his work, Europe After the Rain 2. Now you notice it's called Europe After the Rain 2. There was actually a first picture and you would imagine it looked quite a little bit like this one, but it actually didn't. The title refers to an earlier picture, which is actually a painted of a painting with sculptured plaster and oil um, that was an imaginary relief map um, of Europe in 1933, which was the year that Hitler took power. So that was a very different picture than Europe after the rain too, which he actually begins in a prison camp in 1940 in Europe um, and then finishes it in 1942 after he had escaped to the United States. And actually he was not alone with that. There were quite a few other surrealists who ended up coming to New York City after or during World War II, which greatly transforms um, the future of American art as well. In any case, here we'd see that technique of decalomania to create what looks like this imaginary, fantastic landscape, which now we imagine as this war-ravaged 
continent of Europe. So this picture is very much about his antipathy for the rise of fascism and then the way that we see um, the destruction of European civilization. Um, the forms are bizarre and enigmatic and amidst these forms which look like rock formations and mesas we also see um, dead and dying bodies and people sort of organic matter mixed in with these strange um, inorganic forms of rocks and they're almost one is almost indistinguishable from the next and then the colors are you know against this scene of devastation oddly bright um, particularly that clear blue sky um, even though the scene that we see below is something both sort of strange and horrific you could see the way that animal forms for example are sort of morphed into the rocks um, the central scene are these two figures um, where we see this sort of bird-headed soldier Right, who's holding um, what might have been a spear or maybe it's a battle standard like a flag who seems to be menacingly approaching um, this female figure so we have these sort of mythological or strange hybrid creatures inhabiting um, this destroyed European landscape so here you could see the way that Ernst is using this interesting technique this element of chance to sort of form the images for him and then he manipulates them further and he uses it for this very political purpose. Now if we think about the two works we've looked at by Ernst, he really has a foot in each of these sort of separate surrealist camps. Um, the first work we looked at is far more in the veristic camp showing things realistically but juxtaposing them in strange ways um, that suggest something dreamlike and the second work we looked at is much more in the abstract or the biomorphic or the complete sort of surrealism camp um, but now we're going to look at a different artist Juan Miro who very much falls into the category of the biomorphic or abstract surrealists he is a Spanish painter born in Barcelona and he goes to art school there um, but then he ends up going to Paris and he meets Breton pretty early on he's sort of a member of the surrealists well he's associated with the group right from its beginnings and he participates in that very first surrealist exhibition in 1925 even though he sort of resists having any official association with the surrealists um, Breton regardless of that said that he was the most surrealist of us all um, he is an artist who works in a variety of medium he works in painting but also collage and he makes assemblages um, he does spend some time in Paris which is where the surrealists were active but he always ended up returning to his native Spain and, and actually he did that as well during World War II when he went back to Spain because of the war breaking out throughout Europe but Spain too had um, you know found itself under a fascist regime of General Franco after the Spanish Civil War so it's a complicated and, and very difficult political time for Miro and Europe um, but in any case he is the sort of master of this sort of aut automatism in art so we're going to look at two works by him one of his earliest works to see what his style looks like at the sort of beginning moments of surrealism and then one of his most famous groups of works from the 1930s for Miro we'll start here with one of his very earliest surrealistic pictures and one that he actually showed at that very first surrealist exhibition in 1925 which is called the carnival of harlequin now there's the title is really important here um, harlequin the harlequin is a character from the italian sort of theatrical plays old historical plays called the commedia dell'arte 
Um, the Harlequin was usually, he's a stock character. He's a fool. He's often sort of unlucky in love. He's like a jester. Um, and um, sometimes he's used um, by artists as sort of a stand-in for themselves. So the, the Harlequin that we look at here is this sort of sad figure looking out towards the spectator. Um, he's got the half red and half blue face, which suggests the Harlequin's mask. And the Harlequin um, has this sort of diamond patterned outfit. And so this little piece of diamond pattern on his body could suggest that that's the Harlequin. Um, now, the other part of the title calls it the Carnival of Harlequin, which is probably a reference to Mardi Gras. So Mardi Gras or Carnival um, are the days before Lent, which is the season when um, Christians and Catholics sort of um, Catholics deprive themselves in the Catholic Church. So the season leading up before Easter, there's 40 day period where, you know, you're supposed to live this very sort of ascetic life of deprivation. Um, and Carnival is the days leading up to um, the beginning of Lent. So it's a big celebration in preparation for deprivation, if that makes any sense. Um, in any case, it's like Mardi Gras, right? And so here we see figures throughout the composition who are singing and dancing, and you can see music, and it's celebrating, and it's joyous, except for that Harlequin. Um, so the interpretation of it, I mean, if we, it's been suggested again that it, this might be a sort of stand in for the figure of Miro. And that at the time he was painting this, he was very poor. And there was some, some story about him, you know, coming home with like no food and trying to feed his friend and like all he had was radishes or something. So uh, we could see that the Harlequin, he's got a hole in his stomach. And maybe that's a reference to the sort of starving artist see that he's smoking a pipe, by the way. And then you see all of these figures sort of reveling around him. Um, this is quintessential sort of surrealist. Um, the idea of, of, in, of animating the inanimate. So for example, this ladder form all the way on the left hand side, um, which, you know, has an eye at the top, almost like it's a living thing. Um, ladders, by the way, were symbols that appeared pretty often in surrealist pictures and in Miro's picture as um, a sort of bridge to another realm. So ladders were important. Um, but you can also see that we see sort of forms becoming sort of combined, you know, like animals with human characteristics. Um, so it's got a lot of very surrealist tendencies, but otherwise it is a joyous sort of picture. The whole surface is covered. There's no real focal point. Um, we have this sort of very simple, simple world inside this interior, and then it's teeming with all of this excited animated life. Um, He's probably getting some inspiration from medieval manuscript illumination, um, where the artists in like Romanesque and Gothic times, right? Like in the 11th, 12th, 13th century, um, the painters who had to paint scenes in these little books, often in the margins would paint fantastical creatures in this very detailed miniature style. Um, and we see some of that sense of imagination and whimsy here. Now, this is a primary example of one of Miro's more mature works. Um, it was actually one of a group of 18 pictures he does as a sort of experiment in 1933. Um, the picture itself, you can see the, how Miro fits into this biomorphic abstract um, group of the, um, of the surrealists. Um, it, the title tells us nothing. Okay, the fact that this is an abstract painting is emphasized by Miro because he calls it painting, right? So he's emphasizing the sort of neutral title given to the work. But we do see some allusions to something. You know, we feel like we are in this atmospheric 
place. Um, and we don't know if we're looking at something that really look like amoebas, or we're looking at something on this a microscopic level, or if these are constellations or objects floating in space. But we very clearly can see um, this kind of um, hazy, soft background, and then these very clearly defined forms, some presented only as outline, other as silhouettes, and then others still very sparingly set off and made more noticeable by the use of either white or vermilion paint, that bright piece of red. So what is painting and what was this set of images that he had done? So what Miro did in this year was he was playing with the idea of um, automatic writing. So we talked about automatic writing, the idea that um, you can um, combine words randomly together to write. So he was sort of turning into this idea of automatic drawing. And here he was turning that into automatic drawing with sort of its roots in collage. So he took a group of images that were cut out of um, like magazines, right? These are images of machinery and tools that were cut out of equipment catalogs and newspaper advertisements and popular culture. And so he arranged them sort of haphazardly on these white pieces of paper. And then he used those forms as the inspiration for the final larger scale painting. Now, these are not meant to be seen together, like Miro never exhibits these works side by side, but he did inscribe them very carefully with specific dates, like in this case it's June 13th, so that we could see the linkage between um, one work and another. Now, Miro talked about his technique. He said, um, rather than setting out to paint something, I begin painting, and as I paint, the picture begins to assert itself or suggests itself under my brush. The first stage is free, unconscious. The second stage is carefully calculated. So he's talking about the way that when one creates images, <clears throat> he's moving back and forth between the conscious and the unconscious. So it's really a combination of these two things. Um, you can see the inspiration between these two works if you look um, at the shapes that are implied by these pieces of machinery. You can see the way that they morph into the others, though the work is completely abstract. Um, every once in a while, though, people have seen in the finished version the suggestion that these things are, you know, living objects. Again, we call it biomorphic because these things appear to be organic in some way. So for example, um, this shape here, people have seen as maybe a sitting dog or something like that. So it's like abstract, but there are still hints and indications and references to figural things. The next artist we're going to look at briefly is René Magritte. Um, the Belgian painter who was called the Invisible Man by the Surrealists, both because he was a very low-key um, personality. I mean, considering that we're going to be looking at the Salvador Dali as running in this circle, Magritte was incredibly low-key. And because he ultimately withdraws himself from the major artistic centers, he only really spends between 1927 and 1930, which were very productive years for him, but he only spends those three years in Paris. And other than that, he um, spends the rest of his time working rather discreetly in Brussels. So Brussels, by the way, is also where he studied art. That's where he went to the Brussels Academy of Fine Arts. He was trained as an academic painter in an illusionistic, realistic style, which he really puts to tremendous use um, among the Surrealists. Um, he, Breton didn't really give him a lot of support. Um, and in fact, by the way, when he ended up leaving Paris and going back to Brussels, he also went because he was having conflicts with the other surrealists and because he couldn't find a reliable Parisian dealer for his work. So after that, a lot of his works goes relatively unnoticed. 
um, for much of the rest of his life. Um, he, like I said, he, he was sort of marginal with the other surrealists working in Europe and his style, you know, in the 1940s and 50s was so unlike what they were doing in America, where you have this really, really gestural abstract picture that his very literal meticulous painting style didn't seem relevant. So he's an artist who really is working on the margins of the surrealist style. Uh, but he is one of the most important um, and he raises really interesting issues about the relationship between um, an object and a painted image of an object and what that means. He likes to take realistic objects, recognizable objects, and play with form, juxtapose them in unusual ways, make things defy the laws of gravity. He'll paint sky like it's a material substance that can be cut out um, into hard shapes. So he, he gives a sense of the unusual and the strange to everyday objects. Now, Magritte actually um, began his career doing commercial jobs. He designed wallpaper, he did interior decorating, he made posters, and he worked in advertising. And very interesting, this, this has the characteristic of an advertisement. Um, this is very similar to the sort of signs that would hang outside of a tobacco shop, this hyper-realistic um, three-dimensional image of a very, very literal pipe. You know, looking at this, it seems hard to understand how he fits in with the surrealism and with the surrealists. He actually claimed to not fit in with them in a lot of ways. Um, Magritte's mother committed suicide. She drowned herself in a river when he was 13 years old. In fact, they found her um, and uh, they, you know, like two weeks later and her face was covered by her nightgown. And you will see, for example, these images over and over again in Magritte's art of people with their face covered, like in fabric. So like this is an image that comes back for him again and again. And when he was asked about how his mother's suicide affected him, uh, Magritte said this, he said, psychology doesn't interest me. It claims to reveal the flow of our thoughts and emotions. Its efforts are contrary to what I know. It tries to explain mystery. The only mystery is the world. Psychology concerns itself with false mysteries. It's impossible to say whether my mother's death had any influence or not. So it's just interesting because so much of what the surrealists were doing was tied up in Freud's ideas that Magritte is totally pulling in another direction. Now, this is one of about 40 um, what we call his word pictures that were done. Um, and they are pictures that usually are um, combined with text showing an object and showing a reference to the object in writing. So I think he did about 40, 36 of them are known. This one was quite famous when he did it. Well, in a way. it. It was notable, let's say, because Dali, Dali actually mentions it in an article he wrote for a Barcelona newspaper about art that was happening in Paris. This is one of Magritte's Paris pictures. So like this was singled out by the other surrealists as being a work of some pretty major importance. Um, on the other hand, Magritte um, didn't, you know, he, he didn't exhibit it hardly at all, very, very rarely. He didn't publish it until 1954. So it actually by 1945, there was a monograph or a book written on Magritte and he didn't want this work included. It wasn't included in the first monograph. Um, Magritte told the book's author, I am not very inclined to show the pipe, which might be used as a pretext for shutting me up in a lunatic asylum. So what is going on here? The picture itself is called the treason of images, um, but it is a picture of this briar pipe. And then underneath it, the caption in French, this is not a pipe. So it seems to contradict what we see. What we obviously see is this hyper-realistic image of a pipe. And then the text down below says, this is not a pipe. 
So that is the treachery or the treason of images. Now, very clear. Um, well, that is not a pipe. We could start with the beginning. Um, well, what does this mean? We could, it could mean, the text could mean, this is not a pipe. Well, it's not a pipe, it's, it's a picture of a pipe. And a picture of a pipe is not the same thing as a pipe. We could also read the text to mean the text is not a pipe. Um, we tend to read words and the objects they represent as the same. Um, but the word pipe is not a pipe. The word pipe is just a group of signs and symbols, right? It's not actually a pipe. It's a series of marks. It's even further removed from being a pipe than the picture. And of course, if we just look at the sentence, this is not a pipe, well, the word this is not the same as the word pipe. So this and pipe are not the same. So it's got a couple different sort of language jokes written inside of it. Um, of course, you now, Magritte said he would have been locked in an asylum had he shown this. The image, just so you have a frame of reference, apparently he was inspired to paint this particular image based on um, an image that appeared in the final chapter of Le Corbusier's treatise on architecture. So if you remember Corbusier's, um, we looked at for the Villa Savoy. Um, Magritte, later on, when he was asked about this work, he said, the famous pipe how people reproached me for it. And yet, could you stuff my pipe? No, it's just a representation, is it not? So if I had written on, on my picture, this is a pipe, I'd have been lying. So here he's calling into, um, calling attention to the fact that um, there is an ambiguous relationship between the object and a painted image and between an object and a painted image and the words that represent them. So what he says when he says, you know, could you stuff my pipe? For him, um, what makes it a pipe is its function. And in this picture, it has no function. So therefore, it's not a pipe. And here you can actually see the quote. Now, what's actually pretty funny about this is that Magritte, because this is part of a series of images, he actually pushes this idea further with one of his other word pictures, which is actually not even just a painting. Um, it was a sort of an assemblage, um, which is, this is a piece of cheese which you can see, which is a little bit later from 1936 or 37. It's actually a painted panel inside of a cheese dish with a lid on it. But he calls this, this is a piece of cheese. There's no text. It's just the, the picture, the painted, very literal picture of a cheese. But apparently what makes it cheese is the fact that it has a cheese dish. So just like it would be a pipe if we could smoke it, um, because this is on a cheese dish, it makes it cheese. And so this is a piece of cheese. And just to very quickly show you one more work by Magritte, a little bit later, even than our period for this class, um, which is his, the Promenade de Euclid. So this is the Promenade of, of Euclid. Euclid, which is the reference to, you know, the Greek mathematician, right? We think about Euclidean geometry. Um, so it's called the Promenade of Euclid because we see through the window this street. That's the promenade. You can see figures, two figures walking on otherwise a very decurico like deserted street with that same decurico like thrusting perspective. So there is this um, perspectival view down the street which is the reference to Euclid, it's geometry and perspective. And again, it's that sense of this three-dimensional world looking through a window. So it actually has a lot in common with Ernst, where we started, right? The idea of painting is a window and we're looking into this three-dimensional realistic space beyond it. But then in front of the window, we have an easel, right? And it's holding a painting, which you can see framed here. 
And so this is one of Magritte's favorite devices. He returns to a lot of devices over and over again. This is his picture in picture device. So in front of the view of this city out the window, we see a painting which seems to show the very same thing. So of course the question is, what are we looking at? Are we looking at um, an absolute reproduction of what we should be able to see behind it? Are we looking at a, through a transparent canvas into a real landscape? Or are we looking at a different version of reality, some sort of imagination? So it's very unclear what is real and what is not. And again, that's something that Magritte likes to play with. Um, he's also playing with this two dimension versus three dimension motif by recreating the form of this supposedly three dimensional promenade, the street in the, well, still three dimensional, but much flatter, close to us, not distant view of this conical tower. So those two things are meant to mirror each other and again, call attention to what's real, what's what's three dimensional, what's a painting, what's imagination or what's a real view out the window. So that's what Magritte likes to do. And that's why we put him on the side of surrealism that is very different than the side that we put Miro on. So Miro is with the abstract biomorphic surrealists and Magritte is with these veristic or hyper-realistic surrealists. So again, he's not painting imaginary forms or fantastical creatures like Miro. He's painting things very, very literally, just calling attention to the, ambigu the ambiguous nature of what it's showing us. More than anybody else, it's probably the Spanish artist Salvador Dali that we associate with surrealism. Um, he became the face of surrealism. He became a very fashionable figure. And in fact, he had a very, very public career, which it was almost made him like a star. He was in show business, basically. Um, Dali worked in a lot of different media. He worked in painting, sculpture, jewelry. He made designs for furniture, and he created some of um, the most important surrealist films. He made two of them um, between 1929 and 1930, working with a collaborator. Um, he is born near Barcelona. And so he's always very much attached to his Spanish roots. He had a very traditional academic training. So in that sense, he's like Magritte. Um, but he ends up going to Paris. He visits Paris for the first time in 1929. And through Miro, um, this fellow Spaniard, he ends up meeting the Surrealists and finally he moves to Paris in 1930 to become, for a time, um, an official member of the movement. Ultimately, though, he's going to bonk heads um, and end up with a strained relationship with the Surrealists. Um, eventually, in 1940, like a lot of the Surrealists, he's going to move um, to the United States and his style will shift. Um, especially after 1950, when a lot of his works actually become Christian in subject, even though they maintain their surrealist elements. He is, um, he falls into the camp, certainly, of the artists who are veristic, who are painting in a sort of microscopic style that looks very realistic, though you're going to see him doing it in a far less literal way than Magritte. He defined his style his own way. He called his style paranoiac critical. So he called he painted with a paranoiac critical method, um, which he said this. He said that in his paintings he aimed quote to materialize the images of concrete irrationality with the most imperialistic fury of precision in order that the world of imagination and of concrete irrationality may be as objectively evident as that of the exterior world of phenomenal reality. What he's saying is that he's going to take his um, ima imagination world, which comes from things like dreams and memories, um, and he's going to paint it 
in such a way that it is as concrete and real as the external visible world. Um, he is incredibly interested in Freud um, and in um, this interest in dreams. So, and, and by the way, like Magritte, the imagery from his childhood comes back over and over again, which is something that's talked about in Freud as well, that idea of sort of the fetishism. Um, but he's going to paint with this very, very precise miniature-like technique um, that's going to try to make these visionary things real. For Dali, we can start here with one of the most famous images of all time, um, his persistence of memory of 1931, which he originally called soft watches. Now, can I tell you that I have such a distinct memory? I think this was one of the most shocking things I ever saw, that when I was in college as an undergraduate, I went to Rutgers, and my teacher sent us to the MoMA for an assignment. And I remember standing in front of this picture going, that can't be it. Because I remember sitting in my art history class. You guys are right now all looking at this on a smaller screen. But the first time I saw this class, I was looking at it projected on this huge screen, larger, larger than life, larger than me. And there I am in the MoMA standing in front of this picture that's like the size of a sheet of notebook paper. And I was so surprised. But here you can see that miniaturist technique, that idea that he's painting with very clear precision. In Dali's work, he's actually adopting a very old fashioned style, really from the 15th century, what we call Flemish painting, which was the painting of like Northern Europe in the 1400s, where they painted in this microscopic way, you know, where everything was painted with very, very precise detail. And that's what we see here. Um, these forms set into this landscape, which is painted with such clarity. Um, with these very sort of acidic kind of colors in the background. Um, Dali talks about what inspired him to paint this. Now this is that paranoic critical method. And in that method, uh, he usually started a painting with one image in mind and then followed associations to the next and to the next and to the next so that the work sort of spontaneously occurs, right? Sort of irrational, follow your unconscious associations between one object and the next. Um, and again, it is painted very literally. And Dali, along with the other surrealists, for the most part, shared this dislike for a lot of the other modern art movements, which were interested in form for form's sake. They were still working primarily with content um, as the most important thing. So originally, he starts thinking about the idea of painting a soft watch. And Dali wrote um, his inspiration for this work. It's a little bit long, but it's an interesting passage. So he said, and the day I decided to paint watches, I painted them soft. It was on an evening when I felt tired, and I had a slight headache, which is extremely rare with me. We were to go to a moving picture with some friends, and at the last moment I decided not to go. Gala would go with them. Gala is his wife. Well, at that point she's not. I think at that point she might still be a girlfriend. She was the wife of another surrealist that he meets in Paris, and then he marries her. Um, Gala would go with them, and I would stay home and go to bed early. We had topped off our meal with a very strong camembert, so cheese. And after everyone had gone, I remained for a long time seated at the table, meditating on the philosophic problems of the super soft, which the cheese presented in my mind. I got up and went into my studio, where I lit the light in order to cast a final glance, as is my habit, at the picture I was in the midst of painting. The picture represented a landscape, landscape near Port Legat, Port Legat, whose rocks were lit by a transparent and melancholy twilight. In the foreground, an olive tree with its branches cut and without leaves. I knew that the atmosphere which I had succeeded in creating with this landscape was to serve as a setting for some idea 
for some surprising image, but I did not in the least know what it was going to be. I was about to turn out the light when I instantaneously saw the solution. I saw two soft watches, one of them hanging lamentably on the branch of the olive tree. In spite of the fact that my headache had increased to the point of becoming very painful, I avidly prepared my palate and set to work. When Gala returned from the theater two hours later, the picture, which was to be one of my most famous, was completed. So again, there's that method that he starts painting without knowing what he's doing, and one thing leads to another leads to another. So he starts by saying that he was pondering as he stared at this melting cheese, um, the nature of the soft. And he talks about that in other places, this interest in the soft and the hard and the way those things can morph from one to the other. So here we see four different watches three of them soft, all of them seemingly organic. So we talked about that with Miro, the idea of taking inorganic things and making them appear to be alive in some way, or at least natural. So we see these um, three soft watches. One of them is um, draped over some sort of ambiguous creature, um, which sort of look, it's a profile face of sorts, and it actually is based on um, an element pulled from a early 16th century painting. But you see one soft watch draped over that one. Um, there's another one hanging from the dead olive tree that he mentions. Um, there's another one hanging on the edge of this block with a fly walking on its face. Painted again very real illusionistically, we see the cast shadow from the fly. And then finally there is a face down um, pocket watch, not soft, but covered in ants, which suggests that somehow what we're looking at is organic or, you know, dead, but, but from life and sticky. So that is what he's doing here. He's, he's creating um, this sort of irrational image by pulling together these other forms, but painted in such a way that they appear to be real and literal, right? Even this creature, this dead, dying creature, we don't even know what it is, um, but we, because it, it's sort of this boneless, you can see the way it's draped over this rock, it has no bone structure to it. So again, it's something else that has turned to the super soft. Um, but again, this is this dreamlike state, but everything is painted with um, this very literal nature to it. Now we can fast forward just a few years to Dali's soft construction with boiled beans, premonition of civil war. This work is in the Philadelphia Museum. And can I tell you, I remember this so distinctly because I was an undergraduate when I was sent here to go look at this work and write a paper on it. And I've been fascinated with this and with Dali ever since. Now, what's interesting about this, we've talked about the fact that these were um, Difficult political times. The 1930s is the time of the rise of fascism in Europe. Um, Dali was notoriously apolitical, and that set him apart from some of the other surrealists, because most of the surrealists were um, anarchists. They were against the rise of fascism. Um, and certainly this became a greater issue after Hitler's rise to power in 1933. Um, he quarreled with the surrealists over this. He refused to condemn Hitler, um, mostly because Dali was apolitical in the sense he only cared about politics in as much as he, he cared about whatever gave him something to paint. And if he was fascinated by a figure, he really didn't have a strong political point of view. So he actually paints this picture, which was originally just soft construction with boiled beans, six months before the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War. So, you know, civil war in his native country, um, which, you know, he describes as this figure. Um, he said it was a figure caught in the delirium of auto strangulation and that he added beans for embellishment. Now, it's later on after... Um, uh, 
General Franco and you know, for the fascists overthrow the Republican government or start, start a civil war in Spain, that he adds the second part of the title, Premonitions of Civil War, which turns him sort of into this prophetic figure. In any case, we see, um, I think we're set on the same port landscape as we were Port Legat, which is where, um, which is where the persistence of memory was set. Um, now we have a cloudier sky and maybe, you know, it's some disturbance in the weather, maybe suggesting what's to come with civil war. And now we see this gargantuan figure with this anguished look on its face that is tearing him, itself apart. So this is how he perceives of civil war. And it's actually kind of brilliant rather than thinking about it as two opposing forces, a conflict between two different kinds of figures. It's actually shown as like this psychological conflict of a figure warring on itself. Um, what you can see, you can make out the figure. It's actually, it's in this trapezoidal shape that was said to have been based on an outline, sort of outline drawing of the map of Spain. And we see this figure, um, you can make out its part. It's balanced at the bottom on this sort of fossilized foot and a chest of drawers. And then you could see the figure actually not strangulating itself in any way, but at, at war with itself. There's another figure um, off on the left hand side behind the sort of hand we see laying on the ground. There's a figure of a middle aged man nicely dressed with a downturned head. He's actually taken from another painting that Dolly paints right around the same time. And it's possible that he's supposed to represent some he might be a specific figure but he could just be a man of culture man of learning man of science who's sort of turning away and and dwarfed by the monstrosity of all that's going on around him uh so that is dali's take on civil war and this is going to be interesting because we're going to look at this compared to um, his fellow spaniard picasso right around the same time this, by the way, is painted in that same style, where even though this is an impossibly strange image, it's painted in this hyper real manner. Now, surrealism as a group was not um, one that was particularly hospitable, hospitable to female artists. Um, very often when women were accepted into this sort of inner circle, they were accepted as a person rather than an artist. So she was a uh, Merit Oppenheim, who was young and beautiful. She was an art student, um, a Swiss art student raised in Berlin. She arrives in Paris in 1932 and she comes into contact with the Surrealist when she's not yet 20 years old. Um, she was young and beautiful and rebellious and the Surrealists absolutely took to her and were enamored with her, but not to their art. And they rarely mentioned the art objects that she produced. So it's a little bit of a conundrum for, for the artist and it fits very well with the sort of masculine um, attitude of Surrealism, which often looked as objects, it looked at women as objects themselves to um, be loved, to be feared, and to them to apply um, all their Freudian thoughts on. Um, she is friends closely with a whole bunch of the artists that we've seen, with Andre Breton, with Arp, with Duchamp, obviously Man Ray, and Max Ernst, with whom she has a brief relationship. So we're going to take a look at Merit Oppenheim's most famous, notorious work of art, which is simply called Object. And this is Object. It is a surrealist sculpture. Well, really, it's, um, it's we've talked about the idea of a ready-made, right? Um, this is something we sometimes call ready-made aided. It's like an assemblage. We're taking two different ready-made objects, one being, well, three, I mean, well, Four? <laughs> We're taking the objects itself, the plate, the spoon, the cup, right? That's one thing. This cheap manufactured everyday dinnerware, um, a tea set. And then it is combined with another object not made by the artist, which is obviously this fur, which is um, Chinese gazelle fur. And they're combined together in a way that um, 
upsets both of them. Right. In other words, this is something that André Breton talked about. He said that um, one of the the goals of surrealist art in terms of surrealist object art was to hound the mad beast of function. And so that is certainly something that she does here. So let's talk a little bit about the background of this object. Um, the story goes that the idea for this occurred when Oppenheim was having lunch um, or having a conversation with Picasso, right? Um, but they were out eating. And um, Oppenheim had made this bracelet out of, I think, like brass tubing and covered in fur. And Picasso admired it and then noted to her that really anything could be covered in fur. Um, and of course, she thinks about the fact that the cup and the saucer from which they're drinking could be covered in fur. And when she, her tea grew cold, she ordered from the waiter that she would have a little more fur. And so here comes the idea for this object. Now, originally, when she shows it, she shows it and in 1936 um, in Paris. By the way, it was immediately famous and it was immediately bought um, by the MoMA in New York. So she is a young artist who gained notoriety with this work very, very quickly. When she first exhibits it, she actually exhibits it simply as cup, saucer, and spoon covered with fur. So in other words, Oppenheim was sort of almost treating it like it wasn't an art object, like it was sort of archaeological. In fact, when they installed it um, at the first sort of surrealist exhibition, when they installed it at the MoMA, rather than putting it on a pedestal, as if to say this is a sculpture, they had it in like a glass case, like a vitrine where you would put if you were in like the Museum of Modern Art, like looking at glass cases at like, you know, objects. That's how they installed this. Again, calling to attention the fact that it's almost like a found, a strange found object. It makes it sort of anti-artistic, right, rather than treating it like an art object. Now that changes a little bit with its title, which was actually um, a title that I believe was suggested by André Breton, that she call it Déjeuner sur, it, she names it after Déjeuner sur l'herbe. Remember Manet's painting, The Luncheon on the Grass? So he suggested this work be called Luncheon in Fur, which is a reference to Manet. So that sort of works against this by making it sort of like an object referencing other kinds of art. In any case, it is a weird, quirky object. It has all sorts of um, eroticized intentions here. And it's actually a wonderful work because of the dichotomy between it. It takes something hard, it makes it soft. It takes an object of culture, you know, like a tea set, and then it covers it in fur so it looks like an object from nature. So it switches it around. Um, it both refers to the male and female, and as I said, the sexual nature of a lot of surrealist art is apparent, but this was something that was very much noted with the sort of concave form of the cup and the very, the more phallic shape of the spoon, that this is some sort of, um, you know, commentary or some sort of eroticized thing, but it is both, um, it's both tempting and sort of sensual like you want to touch it but it's also repellent because if you were to use this the way that you would um you would it would be disquieting to say the least but by the way that too has sexual connotations so it is a very very unusual object and she got a lot of notoriety as i said because it got put immediately into the moma its fame grew overnight um but it sort of it, it had a sort of punishing effect long term on her career because she became very famous for this single object rather than having people looking at her larger body of work. And here I am guilty of the exact same thing. Now, I know we've talked about Picasso before, specifically when we talked about cubism, but Picasso lived a very long time and he worked for many, many more decades. And so um, it's interesting to watch the way he interacts with other groups. So Andre Breton had claimed that Picasso was one of our own in 1925. In other words, the surrealists sort of claim Picasso, but Picasso wasn't a surrealist and he had 
different interest, in, di interests. He was not particularly interested in the unconscious, um, but his works were violent and often erotic, and this fit in with um, the mantra of the surrealist. So he occasionally contributed to their exhibitions and contributed works of art um, to Minotaur, to that magazine that they published. Now, I'm only going to show one work by Picasso from the period of surrealism to see the way that his work overlaps. The work in question is Picasso's Guernica. Now, again, let's put this into what we've been talking about with Spain in the 1930s. As we saw when we were looking at Dali, Spain found itself um, in the midst of a civil war starting in 1936. Picasso wasn't in Spain at the time. Picasso was um, totally an expat living in Paris. So he never returned to Spain after 1934. But in 1937, when the Republican government of Spain was in exile, he was asked um, to produce a work for um, the Paris International Exposition, which was like a World's Fair where artists and architects and, you know, crafts makers and all over the world would contribute to these big exhibitions. Um, and he was asked to make a painting for the Spanish pavilion. Right. He was asked early in 1937 in about January um, and the work was needed to be done by summer and obviously it was supposed to be a very large work to fit this public setting. And Picasso was not terribly interested in the project until um, in April there was a bombing of the city of Guernica, at which point he painted this work in a period of five weeks for a very modest compensation, about the equivalent of $7,000. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what this was. Picasso thought that painting should have important subjects. He said at one point, painting is not made to decorate apartments. It's an instrument for offensive and defensive war against the enemy. So what is Guernica? Guernica was a, um, a town, a city in the Basque region of of um, basically, it's an area in southern France and northern Spain, right? And it was known to have been one of the oldest centers of democracy. And then in April, um, there was a bombing by Nazi planes and on the behalf of General Francisco Franco, the, the fascist, and uh, the planes attacked at one of the busiest times of like a market day, and it killed about 7,000 people, um, mostly women and children, um, and it was seen as this um, ter horrific event, and this is what Picasso paints. So he paints it all, interestingly, in black and white, which it, that kind of fits with his cubist idea of reducing the palette so we focus on form. On the other hand, it makes it look like a newsreel, like, like we were looking at war photography in the newspaper, and even the pattern of um, the the lines on the horse's body almost look like newsprint, like like this almost looks like a collage. And so we see this scene of the aftermath of the bar of the bombing. There are burning buildings. You could see a woman leaning out of the window. Um, there's another head, like a tragic face, leaning in the window, holding a candle to illuminate the scene. We see a woman with a broken leg. We see um, disembodied, you know, broken body parts, a severed arm, a severed head and arm. And we see a mother holding a dead child, which is this universal symbol for anguish. It's also supposed to make us um, think of things like the Pietà, scenes of Mary holding the dead Christ. So it's like this universal image of tragedy. The scene are mostly women. And, you know, it, we're, we're sort of witnesses to this tragedy. Um, there's a, a light bulb in the very center and it's eye-like. And some have suggested this is like, the, it's almost like the eye of God, you know, looking in on this scene. Um, otherwise, we see animals. And we see primarily the two major animals are the bull and the horse, which notably are the antagonists in the bullfight. The, the bull is sort of representative of brutality and darkness, and the horse is representative of the people and sort of human reason. You root for the horse, not for the bull. 
And so maybe we're supposed to see these two figures as the um, antagonists of the civil war. Notice, by the way, it's the horse that's been brutalized with a spear stuck through him. Picasso did tons of drawings and studies for this, just like he did for um, the Demoiselles d'Avignon. And um, he spent the most time working on the image of the horse, which seems to represent the suffering of Spain. Then again, the symbol of the bull was often a symbol for Spain as well. So the symbols are not entirely clear, though they're there. Picasso was asked about this. And he said, he was describing the meanings of the animals, and they said, but this bull is a bull, and this horse is a horse. They're sort of a bird, too, a chicken or a pigeon, I don't remember now exactly what it is, on a table. And this chicken is a chicken. Sure, they're symbols, but it isn't up to the painter to create symbols. Otherwise, it would be better if he wrote them out in so many words instead of painting them. The public who look at the picture must see in the horse and the bull symbols which they interpret as they understand them. There are some animals. These are animals, massacred animals. That's all so far as I'm concerned. It's up to the public to see what it wants to see. Okay, so this is an interesting work because we can see Picasso take some of the formal things we've learned about when we talked about cubism, the fracturing of forms into geometric shapes, the limited palette, the shifting of viewpoints, and it allows him now to apply it to this um, sort of fantastic dreamlike sort of image that we would associate more with the surrealists. And just as a note, you know that this image is a powerful anti-war statement. I mean, that's what this was. This was an enormous picture about the horrors of war. Um, it was very political because this was right after the bombing um, of the city. And here Picasso was painting this enormous mural for the international community to see. Um, he cared very much about this. In fact, um, Picasso would not let this picture hang in Spain while Franco was in power. So it went to the MoMA and only went back to Spain after the death of Franco. So this went back to Spain, I think, in 1981. It stayed outside, sort of in exile like Picasso was. Um, and it's an image that we have brought back over and over again. When we fight against war, we use Guernica as this image of human universal suffering. Um, it, it was used in images during the Vietnam War. Here you can see anti-war demonstrations. I actually pulled out these images from um, the beginning of the war in Iraq. And that's an interesting idea because I remember this, that picture from the bottom um, left, there is a copy and tapestry of Guernica in the United Nations building in New York City. And when Colin Powell went before the United Nations to argue for the case of going to war in Iraq, they covered up this picture. Like they couldn't even have this picture on view because it itself was such a powerful statement against the tragedies and the cost, the domestic cost of war. I just very quickly want to pop in and show you two works by um, sculptors in the 1930s as well. And these were both sculptors who had an awareness of surrealism, though they weren't strictly members of the group. Um, the first of these is the English painter Henry Moore, um, who at the time of surrealism, he was not yet sort of internationally famous, but he was already a mature artist, and he was in touch with the Surrealists, even though he, he was in a different world. He was um, the son of a coal miner. He went to art school in London, where he really studied not only the works of the classical past, so ancient art, and then also um, things like Renaissance sculpture, but was very interested, like a lot of modern artists we've talked We've, we've looked at like way back since Matisse, he was also very interested in African art and pre-Columbian art um, as well, which he could see in the British Museum in, in London. Like, if you want to think about him, we would link him with the biomorphic um, surrealists. Um, he certainly has visual things in common with artists like Miro. And like an artist like Ernst, for example, he's very interested in material and process. He let the materials guide the work that he made. Um, and he said this, he said, it's only when the sculptor works direct, 
when there's an active relationship with his material, that the material can take its part in the shaping of an idea. He works in all different kinds of materials, um, but obviously a lot of stone and a lot of wood. And we'll look at um, one of his wood sculptures. Now, the theme of the reclining female figure, which actually has a very long tradition in the history of art, was one that Moore came back to again and again. Now, he was finding references, probably particularly for a work like this, in um, pre-Columbian art. Um, a, he was very interested in these figures, which were called Chakmul. Um, they are thought to be um, worshiper figures. They're these reclining figures with turned heads um, of the type that you can see here. This is a Mayan Chakmul. And so he was studying forms like this, though here you can see forms simplified and simplified and made more and more abstract until they looked very much like the biomorphic surrealism of Miro. Now you remember this idea with surrealism that you move away from the visual world to represent a different kind of truth. I and mean, this is what Moore was doing. And he said this about his work. He said, because a work does not aim at reproducing natural appearances, it is not therefore an escape from life, but may be a penetration into reality. My sculpture is becoming less representational, less an outward copy, but, on, but only because I believe that in this way I could present the human psychological content of my work with greatest directness and intensity. So he's referencing but simplifying these forms. He also seems to be um, inspired by the landscape. And so the thought is that maybe because he was the son of a coal miner, he felt this closeness to the, the dirt, the earth, the rock. And you could see this almost in some ways resembles um, windswept mountains, the way they erode and the way cavities are formed in the earth. He's got a lot of these holes and cavities through the work which is something that he was very interested in as well. He said, the whole connects one side to the other, making it immediately more three-dimensional. The mystery of the whole, the mysterious fascination of caves in hillsides and cliffs. The whole is also an interesting idea too, because it turns the body into a frame as well. The sculpture is about void as much as it is about um, the solid figure. So this would be an example. He was very much looking at the surrealist sculpture being made by other artists like Picasso, and this shows Moore's biomorphic contribution. The very last artist I just want to mention um, is the artist Alexander Calder, who goes to Paris at exactly the moment of surrealism. Um, and some of his early works in Paris um, were of interest to the surrealist, although Calder was not a surrealist. Um, he was from Philadelphia, um, he, but his, his father and his grandfather were also sculptors, so it's part of his sort of family. But he, in fact, studied engineering originally, but that had tremendous importance for his um, for his future art, as you're going to see. Um, he studied painting originally once he abandoned engineering at the um, New York Art Students League, and then he worked as an illustrator, which we've seen other artists do like Magritte. And like I said, before he went to Paris, one of the things he did in Paris, and I, I'm going to post a video for you just so you can see it, was in 1929, so not long after he arrived in Paris and during the Surrealist movement, um, he produced his circus, which was this um, entire environment made of um, animals and circus performers that he made out of wire and found materials. And he found ways to set them in motion, okay, because of his engineering background. He created these figures that could be activated and moved and so that they could perform. It's a very whimsical work. Um, and that is something that the surrealists were interested in very much. Um, but we're going to take a look at one single of his works um, from his more mature career. Now, this is the kind of work for which Calder is best known. And this is an example, one of his largest examples of an early mobile, 
Mobile called um, Lobster Trap and Fishtail from 1939. If you look at the size, you realize this is nine and a half feet across and continued the ideas that he was interested in when he made his circus, which was using wire and thinking about the way that sculpture could move. So Calder, from playing with his circus, you know, the century, sorry, the decade before, became interested in the fact that, you know, the experience of sculpture involves time and space, right? When you look at a painting, you can stand in front of a painting and look at it. But very often when you look at a sculpture, you have to walk around it. You have to look at it from different angles. So it involves space. You're in motion. It involves time to fully understand the work. So he was thinking about the ways to activate sculpture so that it participates in this sense of movement. Now, he's originally um, becomes interested when he visited the workshop of um, Piet Mondrian, his studio in the 1930s, and he looked at his very geometric forms, um, very sort of straight lines, and he was interested in trying to set these forms into motion. Uh, he talked about his visit to Mondrian's studio. He said, this one visit gave me a shock that started things. Though I had heard the word modern before, I did not consciously know or feel the term abstract. So now at 32, I wanted to paint and work in the abstract. So he is not really the first artist that we've even seen to work in art that moves. We saw Maholo Nagy's um, sort of those projector arts, you know, these sort of um, objects that we looked at when we looked at Bauhaus. So we could think of this in relationship to that, but this is not a mechanical device. Um, rather, it's an object that works with the very slightest air currents. So because of his interest in engineering, he has this perfectly balanced objects, lightweight objects on thin wires so that um, they move and change depending on the slightest motion. So you walk past it and it begins to move because it responds to air currents. So this absolutely has a relationship to what we've seen in surrealism. It has the biomorphic kind of forms that we associate with Miro, and it has the interest of the element of chance that we know that the surrealists were very interested in. Um, we end up calling these, we, we use the term mobile all the time, like there's a mobile in a child's room, for example. Um, that term um, gets applied to his early motorized works. Um, um, Calder played with sculptures that were motorized and hand cranked, like we saw, with, like I mentioned with the circus. Um, and Duchamp originally named them mobiles, right, or mobiles. Um, and so that becomes a term that sticks. And then eventually, um, ARP, which we saw ARP before when we looked at Dada, ARP um, said that he had heard the term mobile and he asked if his other works were stabiles. In other words, if you make a sculpture that doesn't move, so technically any sculpture that doesn't move is a stabile, but that was then the term that was applied to it specifically because of Calder. So it's sort of a, an interesting idea because he does make some works that don't move, but he was most famous for these. His works are different from the surrealists in that very often, very well, I mean, but not all the surrealists, if we think of someone like Miro, um, you know, the surrealists in general were against art that was purely formal. And that is what this is. This is just about form. It's called Lobster Trap and Fishtail. And you can see a reference, an abstracted reference to those forms. So there's a lobster and a trap. And then we see what looks supposed to be like a school of fish over here. But it doesn't have any great meaning or importance. And that is something that, um, that is something that Calder mentioned. He said, I want to make things that are fun to look at, that have no propaganda value whatsoever. And having just come off of looking at Picasso and how political his work was, um, later on in Calder's life in the 1970s, he said, I do not think either that an artist can represent in sculpture tragedies such as Pearl Harbor, the atom bomb, or war in general. How can all that be translated into plastic? So instead, his later art um, actually relates to these kinds of sculpture, which he often made for public settings, like he made them for, you know, lobbies of corporations and stuff like that. Um, 
So, you know, scaling this up, but again, not in a way that was ever meant to be political. So that is where I'm leaving surrealism. That was a lot of information, guys, but I hope you like it because it's really cool stuff.